In this video we're going to run CPM on the Altair 8800 computer. We're going to take a look at what the programming environment was like under CPM and also what kind of execution environment the program itself saw while running under CPM. Alright, so let's go ahead and get this computer fired up. Do a hard reset. Set the address switches to 177400. That's the address of the disk bootloader in ROM. We'll examine that location. That sets the PC to that address, and we can hit run, and that boots CPM. All right, let me see if I can focus this. All right, now the cold start welcome message provided by CPM includes a size up here at the top, 59K. Unlike Visual Basic, <laughs> Visual Basic, I'm ahead of myself. Unlike Basic or Altair DOS, this is not CPM measuring how much memory there is in the computer. Instead, it is the size of memory that CPM expects. CPM was specific, specifically created to run in a machine with this much memory. And today we're going to see why that is the case and how that works. Alright, so let's take a look at what's on our disk. Directory command shows us what's on the default drive, which is drive A. And you'll see on here there's a couple programs named Demo. One with an ASM extension, one with a COM extension. If you recall, the .com extension is a ready-to-execute program um, for CPM. It can be loaded directly into memory and um, control transferred straight to it. It's ready to run uh, 8080 machine language code. All right, so to run the program demo.com, all you have to do is type demo and hit return. If you recall from the previous video, if you type in a command and it is not one of CPM's built-in commands, it then goes to the default drive and looks for something that has the name you typed with an extension of com. So we are running the program demo.com. It's asking what is your name. I'll type in my name, hit return, it says hello Mike, that is all this program does. Alright, so extremely simple program we wrote uh, to demonstrate CPM assembly language programming on this computer. However, what's important is that this same program could run on any CPM machine on anybody's computer across the nation. Doesn't matter if it was an Altair, doesn't matter if they had the same serial ports, same floppy drives. That's what made CPM start taking off as it provided a common platform for most any program that used standard I.O. Alright, so let's take a look at how this program might have been written. Obviously you might have guessed that the demo.asm is the source file for this program. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we can look at a source file by using the type command already built into CPM and type demo.asm and we can see the source file of that as type command lists this program. It's a fairly short program but some of it still went by. Uh, wasn't a great way to look at it. In CPM you can pause the display with control S and control Q to resume Frankly, control S resumes as well, so let's take a look at that. So you can see I can pause it here as I get a full screen and then resume as it continues. All right, but what you really need to do is edit the program. To edit the program, you have to use an editor. Now there was a miserable line editor called ED that was provided with CPM, and we're going to use that here just to demonstrate it for history, history, historical sake. So we'll say ed demo.asm. Now even though you just specified the file name to ed, it's still not ready to edit it. You have to read that into memory manually. You tell it how many lines you want to read. A pound sign means all lines. Since it's a small program, it'll fit. And then you say a for append that to the memory buffer. So at this point, you've read in demo.asm into memory. And now we can say, for example, 20 lines, type them. And we'll type 20 lines of the program. And we could move forward 20 more lines and type another 20. And see the program. Alright, so let's go back to the beginning. I'll go minus 20 lines. Now my screen here has more than 20 lines on it, so let's go ahead and type, say, 30 lines. Whoops. I want to go minus 30 lines, 30 type. Alright. What I want you to take a look at first is the org statement here. The org is 100 hex. That is the address at which this program is being assembled. That is also the address at which all CPM programs are loaded. So it's critical that you assemble your programs to load at hex 100. 
Also, the first executable statement has to be at hex 100 because that is where the command processor, the CCP it's called in CPM, the command and control processor, calls that address whenever it starts the program. So you have to have executable code at 100. It could be a jump just to somewhere else in your program, or like in our case, we actually have the program begin there at hex 100. Right, hex 100 is the start of what CPM calls the transient program area. So our program is transient. It's not permanent. That's why it loads at hex 100. So addresses below hex 100 are reserved for CPM. So the obvious question is, well, what about addresses above hex 100? How far can you go? Well, you can't go all the way up to the upper limit of memory because some parts of CPM must remain resident in memory in order to provide the I.O. functions that allow CPM programs to run on any machine. So the question is, how much memory do you have? Well, you can read uh, a location down on page zero that tells you how far up into memory you can go. Technically, that's location six, but that's a detail we don't need to worry about today as to how to get that and what it shows us. But the way CPM is organized is that it is put in as high a memory location as possible so that your program has as much open, contiguous space as possible from 100 hex up to the bottom of CPM, which is butted up against the top of memory. All right, so in our case, we had a 59K CPM. So at 59K working down is CPM. CPM takes about 7 or 8K of that, meaning your program probably can... Uh, use up to say the 52, 53K mark and not wipe out any of CPM at all. Now the question is, do you really need all of CPM in memory? And the answer is no. Uh, what you need is the parts that provide I.O. for you. The command and control processor, the part that responds to your commands like directory and loads programs, that doesn't have to be retained. And you can free up another 2K or so if you clobber that portion of, of CPM. However, when your program is done, it can't return to the command processor because it's gone. So in that case, it has to do what's called a warm start or a reboot of CPM, which reloads portions of CPM that were clobbered back into memory and puts your command prompt back up. We're going to take a look at all that here real quick. All right, so our program starts up here at 100, and what it does is it writes the what is your name prompt, then it reads the user's response. Let's go for 30 lines type another 30 lines then it writes back hello then it writes back what was typed in then it writes the exit message and simply does a return to go back to CPM the reason we can do a return to CPM is because our program is so small it did not clobber any of C CPM not even the command and control processor we left all of CPM in memory so we could just simply return to it all right, so how are we doing the writes and the reads? Let's go back up to the top of the file. Oh, I'll never get this. There we go. What we're doing is we're calling BDOS. That is the basic disk operating system. That is the entry point for all I.O. to CPM. It is an address provided at location 5 down on page 0. So even though that changes depending on whether you're a 24K CPM or a 48K CPM, a consistent entry address is given for us down here at location 5 on page 0. So we always are going to jump to location 5 for every I.O., whether it's a command to write a line, command to read a line. We're going to jump to the basic disk operating system entry point with a command in C. So we've loaded the write line command into C. We have loaded the read line command into C, and then we simply jump to the disk operating system in order to do that I.O. Obviously, it does disk I.O. as well. We're doing simple terminal I.O. So here we load the prompt, write it using CPM. Here we give the address of the input buffer, read it using C CPM. Here we write the word hello using the write line command. Here we write the what was just read by the... Um, person's name back to CPM. Again, all this is using CPM calls for I.O. We are not writing directly to the serial board and the program is getting loaded using CPM as well. It's not calling anything on the floppy board directly. This way it is hardware independent because CPM's lowest levels, the BIOS, has been customized for the hardware to insulate the program from the specifics of the machine. 
All right, so that's the assembly language program and the basic idea of how CPM is called. If we can hit quit. This doesn't save anything we've done. So how do we convert this assembly language program into an executable file? Let's go ahead and erase demo.com just to prove that we are really creating it from scratch. So if you look now, all we have is demo.asm, the source. The assembler we're going to use is the original assembler made by Digital Research Incorporated. That's the company that made CPM. It's called ASM. There it is right there. Now, of course, other companies came out with assemblers. Microsoft had them. Digital Research came out with more sophisticated assemblers like Mac, the macro assembler. And other companies had assemblers and high-level languages, including COBOL, Fortran, Compiled Basics, Pascals. But we're going to use ASM just because it was like one of the originals, and a lot of code was written in ASM. So to compile or assemble a program, you type ASM followed by the source file name. It assumes a .asm. Right, and by doing this, it's going to assemble the program. It's going to write an Intel hex file with the object code. We'll show you what that is in just a second. And it's also going to write a listing file, a .prn file. All right, so it would have told us of any errors. Here, there's no error, so it's all done. So now, we'll use the fact that we can use wildcards see what it wrote. We have our original source, we wrote a PRN file which is the listing, and we wrote a hex file which is Intel hex of our program ready in machine language. What is a hex file? Let's take a look. Very common standard used by EEPROM programmers, all sorts of utilities for exchanging binary or object code. It's all written in visible ASCII hex where it tells how many bytes on each line, what address to load it, Payload is typically about 16 bytes, and then a checksum at the end. So this is a very common object format used by a lot of devices in the days. However, this is still not executable. A .com file is directly executable binary uh, machine language code. How do I make this a .com file? There is a CPM program called load that you give it a hex file name. So load demo assumes a hex file. This loads the hex file into memory and then writes it back out as a com file. See, it noticed the first address was 100, it knows the last address was 179, it had to write one record to hold this program because it's very small. And so now, take a look out there, you see we have a demo.com file. So we actually have the executable program now. So now all we have to do is type demo, and our program runs. All right, now let's take a look at something real quick here regarding exiting if you had clobbered some of CPM. Right now when we run this program you can see there's a delay as it loads it. Type in my name. It instantly pops back to A. The A prompt is immediately there. That's because when our program exits it just has a simple return and the command and control processor, the part we interface with, is all in memory still. So it's immediately ready to execute put up the prompt. However, one of the most common ways of exiting a program is not by simply doing a return, but by doing a warm boot. How is that done? Well, just like the BDOS had a fixed entry for us down at location 5, at location 0 is an entry point that does a warm start, a reboot of CPM. Now, it's not a cold start, it's a warm start. And let's see what that looks like. Anytime you type Control c to abort a program, it's doing the warm start. So if I type control C, you'll notice that this takes a little bit. Control C. See, it took a little while until that popped up. Let's go ahead and do that again and I'll show you the lights over on the computer. Whoops. All right, you'll see the activity here. I'm going to hit control C right now. All right, there it is doing the warm boot, reading those first few sectors to get us back up in memory on CPM. So in CPM it's very very common to start a program or to exit a program by simply jumping to zero which does a reboot of CPM all except for the BIOS basically. So let's change our program to do that. How would we go about that? Well there's other editors besides ED for example WordStar, WordMaster, a couple of popular word processing programs in the day were often used for, for simply editing text files, source files. So I'm going to use WordMaster, demo.asm. Now this is a screen editor. It expects a 24 line screen and this Vince Brill pocket term has given us a lot more than that. So it's going to look funny in that it doesn't quite 
um, fill the screen every time. But here's our program and I can scroll um, down through it a page at a time. If I can figure out how to run it, there we go. Alright, so I'm going to move down here to our return instruction and change that to jump and let's change it to jump zero. Alright, so now instead of simply returning it's going to jump to zero. What that does is then force the BIOS to reload the other portions of CPM. That's the same as the control C. This is the other way to exit and if your program had clobbered the command and control processor you had to exit this way. Alright, so we'll go ahead and exit Everything's a little slow in these days. Just a simple file it takes a while to write. Alright, so now that's our file has been edited. So now we can assemble it again. Let me show you a, a quick option. You can type things after demo. This is not the file extension. It's assuming ASM no matter what. The first one is saying what drive to get the source file, drive A. What drive to put the hex file, drive A. And what file or what drive to put the listing on. Z means don't generate a listing. If you don't want a listing, you can put a Z there, and that speeds up the assembly a little bit. Now, not a whole lot, but a few seconds here, a few seconds there, all adds up in the end. If you just wanted a quick syntax check of your program, you could put a Z in for the hex file as well. All right, so that's all done. We have a new hex file. Now, to create the com file, we do a load. This loads the Intel hex file, converts it into a directly loadable binary object file com file ready to run. So now we can run our program. Type in Mike. And you'll notice the pause here now. See that took a while. Let's run that again. When I hit return here, you'll see it print out this is all it does. Do a carriage return, then the program does a jump zero. This is where it's reloading CPM. And now it's back. So either of those is perfectly acceptable. Um, both of them are pretty normal exit techniques for programs. All right, so that does it. That's a quick demonstration of how to uh, edit a program and uh, enter, exit a program, as well as assemble a program. Now, the one thing I did not mention was stack usage. Um, when you are called from CPM, you only have an eight level deep stack, 16 bytes total. So most programs would create their own stack to operate from. And then if they wanted to return with a return instruction, they'd restore the stack before they did that. Or, of course, you're going to just jump to zero. You don't have to bother restoring the stack. You can just jump to zero and be done with it. Um, our program is so small, you use so little space in its jumps that we just use the stack we were given. But that's the one other consideration that you have to think of uh, when you're doing a program. Do I create a new stack, use the original, and do I exit with a return or with a jump zero? All right, well, that does it for this video. The computer used for the video, video today is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the, uh, the features and functions, the speed, and the weaknesses of a real Altair 8800, but it does it all with modern hardware on the inside. So that way you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer or a collector's quality piece of equipment. You can run all these experiments and learn about this great period in computing history without having to worry about the machine being damaged or trying to get it to work every time. Because it's modern hardware, it'll just come up and work for you each and every time. Be sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this great learning computer.